Thanks for coming, guys. Um, we're going to talk you through a few things today. Um, I'm just going to give you a couple of updates, first of all. From So uh, before we start, maybe I should give you a quick introduction. Um, I'm Graham Breen. I work for HTC um, with B2B developers, be it on new technologies, new SDKs, um, seeking out developers who are doing the coolest things, pushing the boundaries, and really sort of driving business forward. Um, maybe you want to introduce yourself as well, John? Yeah, hi. John O'Neill uh, from Toby. Uh, technology evangelist, which is kind of a fancy way of saying I get to work with really cool companies and people all around the world. Uh, current focus is on enabling enterprise and game companies to utilize eye tracking in VR experiences, and that's why we're here today. So the flow of this, we're going to talk for a few things. I'll give you guys just a quick update on some of the latest and greatest um, things that we're doing, purely because we've just launched a headset recently. Um, so just spread a bit of the word on that about the Vive Cosmos, which you're seeing in the picture here. Um, then I'm going to talk a bit about the Vive Pro Ido, because that's the key to this presentation. Um, we launched our first eye tracking headset earlier this year. Um, and we've seen some pretty cool things happening with it. Um, but from my perspective, and I can say this in a room of developers, not enough actually. So I'm keen to push more people to use eye tracking, um, talk through some of the great ideas and how it can really improve experiences. Uh, we're going to then step over to John, who's going to take that a step deeper. So come from Toby, who we work with closely with the integration of the eye modules. He's going to talk through then some of the development challenges people have, some of the success stories, and how people have used it. Um, we're going to throw it open to questions at the end of that. Uh, it's a really valuable time for us, actually, to get some feedback from you guys. So um, if you've got any questions, please save them up and bombard us at the end. So without further ado, so this is the Vive Cosmos, um, launched earlier this year. I'm going to jump that slide, because we've just done it. Um, Vive Cosmos actually launched a couple of weeks ago, I should say. Um, it's an important step for us, this one, because it's PC-based VR, so it's tethered VR, but this is the first time we've actually dropped in the base stations here. So it's inside-out tracking. Uh, key to that, of course, is the fact that, or I'm assuming most of this room at some point have set up a Vive, um, which is a great experience, but can also be infuriating as well. As you know, the base stations, the time it takes, Cosmos is very much plug and play. So the inside-out track in there allows that. Um, the way it works is actually six cameras on there that are tracking the environment around you. Two on the front, one on each side, one on the top and one on the bottom. And they give you, as you can see here, very wide. They're wide-angle cameras. They give you a very wide field of view, which is awesome if you're doing what I'm doing now and your hands are actually out of your direct sort of forward vision. They still remain in tracking, and that's actually down part of the body and up above the head. So it's a really wide view in there. Um, we've also worked on making the screen sharper as well. So resolution-wise, we're marginally beyond where we were with Vive Pro, but actually that's only part of the story. Um, we've worked on the lenses, and in particular, removing, removing some of the god rays from there, so some of the experiences that people have in some of the other VR as well. Um, screen door effect is something we often talk about where you're seeing grid lines and so on, and that's something that we are removing with Cosmos. Um, if anyone hasn't tried Cosmos, by the way, I think there's one on the show floor downstairs with InnoActive. I'm sure those guys would be happy to show you what they're doing with it. So I've kind of stolen all my thunder here, what I'm just talking about there, about the great visuals. Um, there's a few things, though, that remain dear to us in high-end VR. So one of them is running at 90 hertz. And a few, another one, actually, is the fact it works with glasses. I'm looking around the room, lots of people here with glasses. It was kind of key for us at the beginning that it should be a comfortable fit over glasses as well. Um, it's a bit of a different step for us. Those of you who have used, uh, say, a Vive or a Vive Pro, you know that the weight is generally borne on the face. You've got a strap there, but the weight then falls onto the face. This one, we're perching the weight on the crown of the head with a very comfortable head strap. And actually, that results in a more comfortable experience. You obviously tighten it at the back then, very much like, say, a cycling helmet with integrated earphones. Um, 
like I say, you can see the size of the foam in there, so it's a very comfortable head strap. Um, what it's really aimed at is the fact that you'd, you can spend a long time in there and not feel the discomfort that a lot of the time people do feel in VR. So we've upgraded the controllers there as well. Um, one of the feedback from Gen 1 Vive was controllers were awesome for their tracking, but they don't sit so ergonomically in the hands. Um, so we've tried to change that. We've got separate left-right controllers now. The grip button is actually on the side, so when you grip, you really do grip. And we've swapped out the thumb trackpad for a joystick as well. If anyone's tried to explain the thumb trackpad to um, somebody who's quite new to VR, you probably understand why. It's an awesome thing if you get it, but if not, it can be a challenge. Um, so importantly, it's not just the headset. It will expand, so there's a wireless adapter coming with it as well. Um, we know the Tether has always been a problem for certain businesses where you want to remove those cables, so the wireless adapter is coming. Um, but this is actually quite an interesting one as well. There is a modular system on the faceplate on the front, so the faceplate actually detaches, and you can swap in other faceplates. So what we've actually got here is if you have say, a uh, Vive Pro in your office at the moment, you can actually attach this faceplate and get the precision of Steam VR tracking, pop the faceplate off, stick the standard one on, and then take your headset out to a client. So the idea is it allows you to be flexible, and it allows you to use your headset either in a fixed environment or on the go. So that's Cosmos. Um, like I say, that's launched a couple of weeks ago. There's one at Interactive downstairs, so please go try it. So on to the core of what we're going to be talking about today. So this is Vive Pro. Uh, Vive Pro launched earlier this year. Vive Pro Eye, I should say. Um, out of interest, who in the room has used a Pro Eye with eye tracking? Two, three, four, five. So single figures, most definitely. Um, we were talking to somebody a few minutes ago who's actually whose company is developing using it and some of the benefits, and it's quite refreshing hearing that. So we'll talk you through some of those now. Um, so the Pro Eye is, to all intents and purposes, the existing Vive Pro, but with integrated eye tracking functionality in there. So it's a very non-invasive thing. You notice it if you look for it, otherwise you don't. It looks like you're putting on a standard VR headset. If you're seeing them in the wild, you can differentiate them from a standard Vive Pro. They've got slightly lighter blue on the rings, the camera rings on the front. But otherwise, it is a standard Vive Pro. Um, so what are we actually seeing people using it for? Um, a large part of what I've been doing this year is actually looking for companies who have interesting ideas of what they can do with eye tracking. Um, at the moment, most of the functionality is falling into a couple of use cases. So one of them is actually using it for replace. You've all seen sort of that, um, the old school applications with gaze and a pointer, and you sort of aim your head and, but real gaze where your eyes are looking with Pro Eye. So you can actually replace that menu selection with gaze. Um, another one that we're seeing people doing quite a bit of is um, analytics. So I'm designing a car. Where are my eyes actually looking? What am I actually talking about? What is it that immediately pulls my attention? Those kind of discussions. They've always been quite difficult ones to have where you have trouble maybe explaining something. Um, the analytics in your eyes really doesn't lie. It gives you a very, very accurate readout. Um, and the, probably a the third one on there that's worth mentioning is foveated rendering. Um, foveated rendering offers some awesome possibilities where we're able to super sample where your eyes are actually looking. Um, this offloads the GPU, and it allows you to create a more harmonious experience. Um, we're going to go into that in a few minutes in a bit more detail with John. But um, this is one, actually, that it kind of amazes me that not more people are doing it. It's kind of a no-brainer if you want to improve your fidelity and yet not sort of expel unnecessary effort on the GPU. Um, just a few of the other things here. Like I've mentioned, you've got all the benefits of the Pro Eye. So you've got the high quality displays, you've got the large room scale environment, and you've got the high quality audio as well. So those two worlds completely coming together. Um, this is a spec sheet. I don't really like talking through these too much, so I'm going to keep it super short. Um, 
probably the most important thing to mention are the eye tracking specs on the right, and especially the top one. So the, the gaze data, we're doing it at 120 hertz. So taking a very, very high frequency of data there. Um, if anyone wants these details, by the way, these are publicly available. I'll happily share them with you, but otherwise I'm not going to talk through the specs. I think it's more important to talk through the usage and some of the things we're doing with it. Um, if anybody hasn't been developing or is thinking of developing with the Pro Eye, this is actually part of our website where you can find the resources that will allow you to do so. In fact, I encourage everyone here, by the way, um, we've got a developer portal on our website. Um, it's home to our SDKs, but it's also home to a lot of our developer features as well. So, for example, um, registering devices with warranties, um, and it's going to be home to things, for example, such as um, some of the other features for the standalone headsets, such as MDM head and forwards as well. But the key thing here is we keep the SDKs here as well. So they all live under the, the Vive Sense term for the eye tracking devices in the Pro family. Um, and we've got the mega catchy term, the top left one there, of Shranipal, um, which stands for Super Reality Animation Pal. Uh, don't ask why. But the key thing is that will allow you to, yep, to head into the world of eye tracking with Pro Eye as an SDK. And it's, like I say, it's readily available. So, yeah, I encourage you all to head there. Um, before I move on, maybe it's just worth pointing out, we've got a few other SDKs there as well that are really interesting as well. Hand tracking, um, I mean, uh, we saw hand tracking announced um, on stage at OC6 a few weeks back. Um, hand tracking's been something we've been doing actually for quite a while. Um, with the cameras on the front of the device, we can track your hands. We've taken a 21-point pose on your hands. So, yeah, hand tracking. Also, something called SR work, so using the front-facing cameras to blend realities as well. So there's a bunch of awesome tools there for you guys to use. Um, but let's head into the eye tracking SDK and some of the functionality that we've got within there. Um, so it supports a couple of bits of hardware, the first of which is the Pro Eye that I've been talking about on the left. Um, but we've also put something else on this slide as well. This is a prototype. Um, if anybody's got any great uses for this, please come and see me afterwards because we are looking for companies who do. Um, and like I say, this isn't a production product, but it's a prototype really to, to get people developing. Um, but this doesn't just track your eyes, it tracks the lower half of your face as well. It clips onto the headset and it tracks your lips and your jaw. And we'll see a bit of the output of that in a second on a slide that we've got. So like I say, we're tracking the eyes and we're tracking this potentially. Um, if anyone's doing anything avatar-based, that offers you a world of possibilities. Um, with data around the mouth and with eyes, you can extrapolate to the rest of the face, um, which is awesome because I'm kind of generally very expressive when I talk, so I expect an avatar to show that same expressiveness. Um, Here's an example of how it actually works. So this is one of our engineers doing it. Um, so as you can see, we've got the eye tracking here, but hopefully we're going to start to see their mouth in a moment. But we're tracking the whole face here with this. Important, as you can see here, we're actually tracking single eyes. So it's not just um, the two of them, but you can actually do single eye tracking as well. And here we go. So this is what we're achieving with the, the lip tracking, the, the, oops, the lower face tracking device. We're actually tracking, and it's pretty accurate, I think you find. One of our engineers had to pose for this, unfortunately. <laughs> As part of the SDK, um, we actually provide a few custom avatars that people can use and play with. This is actually one of them. So that's the most human one. <laughs> Some of the others are a bit more playful. But really, that's up to developers what they want to do with that. OK, so we are reaching the end of that. Um, I think this is probably a good chance, actually, to hand over to John, who's going to go a tick deeper into some of those eye tracking functionalities. And yeah, some success stories in there. Fantastic. I got green for it. Excellent. Um, so as I said, a lot of times I work with and, and try to find companies 
enterprise, gaming, training, medical applications who are interested in why bother? What is eye tracking potentially used for, used for? And I can talk about the ideas of what we look at, and then we'll dive into some of the things that studios have started using. Uh, curiosity, development audience, coders, implementation, artists included, I'm not gonna bias it towards one or the other, design, and then business. And everyone else is just really interested in hearing us talk or afraid to raise their hand. So some of the amazing things, um, immersive design, you know, getting into something that is more responsive, natural. Uh, when we interact with an environment, we use our eyes. If you're thinking about the ways that we interact and apply that to your design, your end users are gonna have a more natural experience. And I'll use those words a lot, hopefully. Natural, immersive, things that are clean, things that are simple. It shouldn't, you shouldn't jump in and try to overcomplicate things. Uh, a lot of the developers, when they first get their hands on a kit and use eye tracking, they'll throw a little icon, a little dot on the screen. And that's great for debugging. But then in the real world, do you actually have a dot floating around where you're looking at all times? You don't want your users to think about the fact that their eyes are being watched. That's kind of creepy, actually. You know, something that is more natural to the experience is the direction that a design team typically will go in, and you'll find the most comfort from end users. And this is information that we as Topia have learned over a decade, over a decade, of working with eye tracking, previously outside of VR. When the experience is responsive, you don't have to tell the user it's tracking your eyes. The user is going to know. They're going to have a better interactive experience. Another simulation and training, uh, we briefly touched on that, the assessment capabilities, being able to know specifically where someone is looking as opposed to just where the head is tracking. There is one use case I'll briefly touch on with a client that we have working, has been working with eye tracking um, and helping actually in situations just like this to teach people how to become better speakers and interact with an audience. I may be looking around, but my eyes do a tremendous amount of navigation. Gaming and entertainment. So is anyone in the gaming space at all, or are we all enterprise? Some? Excellent. So I actually started in gaming. 25 years ago, I got to start in gaming. And the reason I bring gaming here, there's a tremendous amount that enterprise applications can learn from game development. And subsequently, there's a tremendous amount that game studios can actually learn from enterprise. And we'll touch on that with two example use cases in a few minutes. Telepresence, anyone working in the telepresence space, doing social interactions, virtual meetings? So your avatars, if they're just static and lifeless, not believable. Adding simple eye tracking where you have expressions. We'll look at a little bit of an expression. We have facial and lip gestures that can also be applied. If you're talking to someone in a virtual scene and they're more lifelike, that's more engaging. You're likely to have more of a meaningful conversation. And then assessment and analytical studies. Um, one of being able to look at where an audience of people are looking at something in your application and using that data at a later time. First one I want to jump in is actually a case study by a studio based out of Dallas called Farbridge. And Farbridge created a product called Masterworks. Masterworks is essentially a virtual reality field trip. It's a museum application they've done in VR. And we started working with them early last year in taking an existing product they had built and saying, what can you do? What can you solve by adding eye tracking? And part of that is us helping them identify and refine a process of why bother changing a product that you have already built and improving it. What can you do? And I asked them, after they'd done the integration, after they tested this with the users, what they thought. Um, I'll just read their quote. Uh, Initial experience of everyone in the office has been very smooth. Even without calibration, everyone has been impressed with the accuracy. A few jumpy, stubborn interactions, but it seems like they can be fixed with calibration or better layout. So layout's an important thing as well. Um, there's a UI paradigm that should be considered 
whenever you're building in VR, but in particularly this developer discovered their placement of objects was not as intuitive and easy to interact with when they went from a head-mounted head tracking system in the HMD to eye tracking. So before they added eye tracking, manual hand controller driven teleportation. If you've done development, you've interacted with products, you've probably done the magic throw wand, aim, point in the direction you're going. Now remember, this is a museum application. It's not a game. It was meant to be very engaging, but not pulling the user out of an experience of being in these locations. And so forcing the user to have to navigate by aiming, you're pulling an arm, you're aiming, and you're clicking. So that's one area we identified. Information pop-ups, it's a museum application. We've got learning information. If the user is looking at something, it would be really interesting to know contextually sensitive information that we potentially could pop up if they're gazing at something over an amount of time. We don't want to immediately have something up here, but if they're focusing, if there's a fixation over a certain amount of time, have that information appear. And then I briefly mentioned the UI interaction. So after they added eye tracking, their biggest gain was the teleportation system. And I have a brief video and I'll show you how, what they actually did. Instead of forcing the users to aim and target, they can now engage, they could rest their arms, toggle a button, and look where they wanted to go. Release, and they moved. So there's visual feedback when that engagement of where are you teleporting, as opposed to having to point, you look. Contextually sensitive information could be displayed, and the user interaction system was improved when they were using eye tracking as opposed to point and engage. And this is their application in a brief summary. So holding down the trigger and looking in locations, information could appear and then they transport and teleport without actually having to have an aim target. And this is the Mesa Verde uh, location in one of their demonstrations. I'll actually jump to some UI experiences. Their UI placement, the spacing on buttons was the largest issue that they needed to address. And we worked with them to improve their UI, and this is actually uh, information that we present on our website, vr.toby.com. All this will be at the end of the slides. Um, to give you a little best cases, best practices in how to improve an experience. And this is one, for example, where menu placements, where you have eye tracking, menu items are too close together. Add space. Add visual feedback when a gaze is engaged in a UI location. Those simple changes made it so much more effective for Farbridge to actually allow eye tracking to smoothly and naturally navigate. The second example I want to briefly touch on was a, a client we've been working with for quite a while now. And this was uh, the one I mentioned with regards to interacting with public speaking. And previously, this studio, VR Speaking, actually used the head direction as an indication of heat map and gaze engagement with an audience. But you can only track and detect areas where you're looking. Adding eye tracking allowed them to improve their heat map to understand in assessment of how well the person is speaking, how well do they pan the audience. I'm not doing a great job right now. I would fail their application. But instead of knowing just where in general they were looking, how well did they cover an audience? How long did they gaze? How long did they engage? How often did they move their eyes in addition to their head? Without eye tracking, that wouldn't be possible. One of the interesting things I often tell game studios versus enterprise, game studios at eye tracking, it's a nice natural extension, but it's only called a nice to have. It's not a must have. Enterprise applications like this you cannot actually do what I just described without knowing where the eyes are looking. So it's a must have. That in turn potentially opens up opportunities for that company to offer that as an additional service, which means additional potential revenue, and additional offerings that they can 
um, extent. I do want to talk about some examples in gaming. And the reason I bring gaming up again, game studios understand for success the importance of immersion, engagement, and fluid environments. If a game is not fun and easy to use, people aren't going to buy it, they're not going to recommend it. And so there's a tremendous amount of work that goes into the user experience. A lot of those same paradigms, the same technologies can be applied in enterprise development. And so when we work with gaming studios, a lot of the knowledge we gain, we bring over and apply to enterprise and vice versa. This company, Flight School Studio, uh, they actually developed a product called Manifest 99. Manifest 99 was a interactive experience again. It's almost an interactive movie in a sense. Very dependent upon fixation locking into the eyes of target characters. And they built this amazingly before I even knew them. I stumbled upon them and said, wait, you're, you're building something where you have to catch the gaze of a target? Oh, we've got to work together. This is perfect. This is, this is eye tracking all, all over. And so Manifest 99, it's basically a story. And the story experience is a short experience in VR. But the initial implementation, again, was based on head mounted and so if we think about when we're interacting in a normal environment and I'm looking in a direction and working with something, I'm not constantly shifting my head to focus. I go into a gentle area and my eyes do all the precision. And so we thought what would be interesting with them is what if we did the same thing? And again, from the developer, we changed the navigation system by allowing eyes to gaze in the direction. With a very careful, again, exception to say, don't draw where the eyes are looking. Provide feedback to know that you have positive engagement and positive direction so that the user knows they're doing it right. But don't draw a cursor. End result, before, head gaze activation. Pretty simple. You're going to guess. Now it's eye gazed. The reason and I just described another example video of head interaction as opposed to eye interaction. Eye interaction is natural. We do this now, natural. Again, I key in on that word, natural interactions. Without eye tracking, you're forced to move the head. And so this is a brief, brief developer video of what they actually achieved with their game experience. And so they have crows. And if you notice, there was a brief moment where you had the two eyes showing where you're engaging, a visual feedback system to know that you've locked onto the target correctly, and then an amount of time to actually engage and give feedback. So in that case, the person looked away for a moment and then re-engaged with the target character. This end result means Manifest 99 is completely controller-free. So they can put this experience anywhere with no controllers and allow people to have an interactive 7 to 10 minute story that would be told. We took that same studio on their subsequent product and said, what can you do with interaction now that you've learned how to replace engagement with gaze? And this is an example I'd like to talk about where there's times when the interaction experience, you have to consider your audience and consider the potential learning that may have been done before you had eye tracking. This product was released, uh, actually existed as a survival game. Uh, cute little survival game, had great opportunity for us to introduce and examine character interaction engagement with this, this crab character. And then more importantly, what would happen if we used interaction as opposed to aiming and clicking using eye engagement to select targeting. And what we found, the eye tracking and prioritization of the target objects, they had a good distribution of objects, but users who had already experienced the game had developed their own mastery of fast optimized grabbing without even moving their head. And so in that case, the developer realized we can't just force people to use only their eyes or only the, the aiming. 
people are getting accustomed to how to quickly master a gaming experience. So they had three input modalities. You could assist with eye selection, you could aim with a controller, or you could allow them to simply grab if they knew where it was going. Uh, this is a, a little video of actually how the game itself works. And so the head direction facing forward, the eyes looking at objects, there's times when you'll see that objects will highlight that aren't directly in front of the head. And it's a very fast game. You're basically trying to stay alive on this island and doing fun things like burning fish and stabbing fish and eating things. I want to briefly talk about, uh, I think I mentioned, uh, the social avatars, the engagement, the importance of eyes. I mean, they're the windows to the soul. And so having avatars that are engaging and responding, showing eye motion, much more believable, uh, users will have a connection to this, winking, interacting, uh, very easy if you know where the eyes are pointing. One of my favorite characters, anyone know who that is? Chevy Chase, awesome. Uh, one of the things I, I thought about, I was working with a company that's trying to do a tremendous amount of realistic facial expressions. And working with them made me realize this guy, this actor, especially in, in most of his movies and many people, we don't just look. The face has extreme amount of expression, but it's subtle. When we try to replicate that in an avatar-based experience, the believability is so much stronger if in addition to eyes, there is a facial expression. There's a tremendous number of muscles. And in development speak, using blend shapes, uh, there's actually a, a part of a kit in our SDK that allows you to use blending. If you in, introduce eye direction and blend modes, you can actually, on the left, no blend shapes. On the right, more expressions. Responding to avatars as well. No. Looking at objects, looking, engaging with characters, having emotional responses. I'm more of the awkward one right now, looking away. And of course, foveated rendering. So foveated rendering is exciting because for most developers, it's going to be easy to build the support. Anyone working with Unity or Unreal? So a lot of people, and then outside of that, your own development. So Unity and Unreal, integrating foveated rendering where you're basically processing the tremendous amount of detail in the fovea. Everything else falls off. Has anyone had the opportunity, I think we asked this before, to experience what foveated rendering really does? So foveated rendering, when it works, you don't even know it's working. That is the holy grail of working with this. An experience, uh, the user should not experience or know that foveated rendering is actually on. So game engine integration, Unity on Unreal, right now through shaders and eventually through injection directly in the engines is coming. If you're interested in working, if you have a product now that is using Unity on Unreal and you need assistance, we would love to talk to you about how to make it better, as would Unity and Unreal. I'll tease on that. And we did say there would be a little bit of code, so I had to throw some code up there. I don't have actually a, a station where I can put it up there, but getting started, and this is actually an injection uh, directly in Unity with our SDK. Very simple, should be straightforward. And the Unity developers are probably familiar with you know, just pulling in some prefabs, dropping them in and going. It's exactly what we provide. So you can take advantage of a couple of different things. You can get the pure direction of where the eyes are going. Great thing is, if you build support and you're using eye tracking data, and for some reason a target user does not have eye tracking enabled, it will default to the HMD direction. 
So you don't need to special case things. You can actually have HMD fallback head mounted display. If you'd like more optimizations where you don't necessarily want to use target array, we also provide a great solution called gaze to object mapping, where we will, inside of a Toby module in the XR class, give you a list of objects that are potentially in focus and prioritize those items. Helps to optimize and make more efficient the process of selecting interacting with objects, so you don't need to figure that out. <laughs>